Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I started a series of studies called the three salvations and you have salvation that's eternal salvation, you have salvation in this life and then you've got salvation from this life, the catching away of the body of Christ. And I got through salvation for lost sinners and I never continued and the Lord got on to me and said you know what with things that are going on in my life I'm going to use myself as the bad example as we're going through these studies but salvation for saved sinners this is going to be an intro to a three-part series right, after this might be a little bit of a long intro because there's a lot of information I wanted to talk about and God just blessed me I just love his word so get your King James Bible out make sure you're following along okay turn to Philippians 2 5 this is what really opens up to where it talks about salvation in this life not eternal salvation, just your life as a Christian today, from the day that you're born again to the day that you die or are caught up by the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. So Philippians 2.5 Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Remember we talked about in Romans 8? It goes, uh, not Romans 8, that uh, has to do with the law of sin and death versus the law of God, which is the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. But he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, he was in a body that was capable of sin, yet Jesus, was, yet Jesus himself was perfect. He was sinless. Okay, Made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. You know, he prayed in the garden, If it be possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Okay? That's what it's talking about. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That name is Jesus. Okay? It's not... Yeshua, it's not Yahashua, it's not Jehovah. The name, God has many titles, but the name is Jesus. Okay. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. No, it says should bow. People will tell you it doesn't mean everybody's going to bow. Yeah, should bow. Everybody, just because it says should doesn't mean it won't happen. Everybody's going to bow. Should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to God, to the glory of God the Father. Okay. Verse 12. Wherefore, this is Paul speaking to Christians. Wherefore? My beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. How many times have you come across people that they put on a great show in front of other people, but by themselves, you'll catch them doing things by themselves when they think no one's looking, that they shouldn't be doing. How many of us are like, well, nobody's around, I guess it wouldn't hurt, and we choose to sin. Paul's saying, just because a brother or sister in Christ isn't present doesn't mean that that's okay for you to go. He's saying, not just in my presence are you guys doing it, but even in my absence you guys are doing your best to live for Jesus Christ. But now much more in my absence, because Paul knew he's not going to be around forever also. I'm not going to be around forever. A lot of the preachers that are preaching and standing into the King James Bible, we're not going to be around forever. So, not just in our presence, but in our absence, you need to be doing your best to keep reading King James Bible and living it. Okay, but here it is, in our absence. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, people say that's a contradiction because we always try to teach that salvation belongs to the Lord. Eternal salvation belongs to the Lord. Absolutely. God's the one that does the saving. It's not your salvation. It's His. But when it, this is talking about something else, when it says your salvation, okay, with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That answers it. Everybody has to answer to Jesus Christ. Saved 
and lost. This false teaching today that, hey, once you get saved, you're, you're off scot-free. You don't have to answer for anything. You're, all your sins are forgiven, period. There's no consequences. You can just do whatever you want. It's a false teaching. Everybody has to answer to Jesus Christ someday. You know, when you're answering to Jesus Christ as a saved sinner, do you have good fruit or bad fruit? The lost world has evil fruit and bad fruit. But someone who's saved, they're going to have some good fruit, but they're also going to have some bad fruit, if not a lot of bad fruit. Okay? We all have to answer to Jesus Christ. What is this talking about when it says work out your own salvation? It's talking about your walk with the Lord. Your life as a Christian. Because someday you're going to have to stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, and you're going to have to answer for your life as a Christian. You know, getting drunk is a work. But is it a good work or a bad work? Getting high, playing video games, watching Hollywood movies and TV shows. I'm pricking myself right now. Okay, that's, that's my addictions that I've been struggling with since I got saved. God's got me mostly clean of it, but the temptation's still there, and I still fail the Lord sometimes. Okay? These are all works, but are they good works? No, they're all going to be burnt up. And I could say a lot more about all kinds of works that are sinful. Going out and handing out gospel tracts, that's a work. Is that a good work? Absolutely. Okay. You have good works, you have bad works. We're all going to have to answer to Jesus Christ. Turn to Romans 14, 12, uh, 10, I'm sorry. Romans 14, 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or was to, why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's not saying you can't judge a brother and sister of Christ. You have to read the context here. But this is Paul saying we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11. For as written as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everybody, saved and lost, has to give an account of himself to God. Jesus Christ. Who is capital G God. All right. But what he's talking about there is if I've sinned and I repent and I forsake and I get back to with my walk with the Lord, why are you still judging me on that sin? I'll have to answer for that mistake to the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. We need to move past that. That's what Paul is talking about when he's talking about judging. He's not saying you're not allowed to judge your brother, period. Why are you judging them on something that God's going to deal with them? At that point, there's a lot of times, brothers and sisters in Christ, in your life, that you're going to be dealing with the brother and sister in Christ, that you have to give, it to, Je you have to give them to Jesus Christ. God will deal with them. God will deal with them at the judgment speed of Christ. They listen to you, repent, forsake, let it go. God will deal with them at the judgment seat of Christ in both concepts, whether they repent or whether they don't repent. We're both still going to have to answer at the judgment seat of Christ. But you see there, the judgment seat of Christ. There is no, you get off scot-free. I don't have to answer for anything, and I can do whatever I want in this life, and live however I want, look like the world, act like the world. No. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Where's the fear and where's the trembling today in the professing Christian world? It's not there. They got no fear of the Lord. They look like the world, they act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes and just live in sin and try to justify sin and everything. And where's the fear and the trembling? It's not there. Turn to Matthew 10, verse 28. The fear and the trembling. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You say, well, this is for lost people. Absolutely. I'm not going to hell anymore. I deserve to, but by God's grace, I'm not going there. But does the fear end? I get saved, so now I don't have to fear God. What about all the passages in the Old Testament where it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Fearing God. We just read up there in Philippians, you're supposed to work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Why is there fear and trembling? Because you go back a few verses and it talks about how Jesus, we're all going to have to answer to Jesus Christ. Even as a saved sinner, you and I are going to have to answer to Jesus Christ. 
there still needs to be some fear and trembling there. When you look at this world, I'm getting ahead of myself, but when you look at this world, you're like, I don't want to go that direction. I don't want to be like them. I'm not going to act like them. I'm not going to do those things. Okay? And when you start getting tempted, it's that fear that's supposed to motivate you. Fear in the Word of God is supposed to motivate you to stay on the straight and narrow. There's still supposed to be fear and trembling there. And in these last days where that temptation is everywhere and there's sin all around us, that fear and that trembling needs to be there a lot. Some people say, well, it's not supposed to hardly be there. It needs to be there a lot, especially in these last days. And I know a lot of you brothers and sisters in Christ can understand and have great testimonies of struggles with sin. We're going to be talking about three areas in, these, in this three-part study, and we're going to get to it. Just uh, There's all this information I wanted to get through first before we get to the main three things. But I'm pretty sure you guys have great testimonies on it. I just don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay. The fear is supposed to be there. There's salvation. So there's salvation in this life from when you're born again. It's not eternal salvation. It's temporary salvation in this life. Because the moment you're born again to the moment you die, or the catching away of the body of Christ happens, if it happens in our lifetime, praise the Lord, and I pray it does, that salvation is yours. You've got to make sure you're doing your best to live for the Lord. Because everything you do from the, in that time period, you're going to have to answer to Jesus Christ for. And I did, like I said, three-part study, three salvations. This is not talking about, people will grab this and try to misuse it for eternal security. No, it's not talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about salvation in this life as a Christian. So we're going to turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 2. And we're going to go through and talk about some things that have a lot have to do with the lost world. I understand. But there's things in here that it, it's the best. There's three things that if you want to sum it all up, there's three things that will derail a Christian's walk with the Lord. That will hurt your salvation in this life. Okay? That will hurt your walk with the Lord. It will hurt your ability to be fruitful. Okay? So Mark chapter 4 verse 2. This is Jesus. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. That has to do with us, okay, when we, when we get into this study. Verse 8, And all fell on good ground, oh, I'm sorry, all, and other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some a hundred. And here it is, verse 9, and he said unto them, he was addressing the Jewish people that are there, but he said unto them, here it is, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Do Gentiles have ears? Absolutely. Do men have ears? Absolutely. Do women have ears? Absolutely. He that hath an ear, I know it says he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. You have ears to hear? It's for you. I just wanted to point that out. Mark 4:10. Uh, Let's keep going. When he was uh, was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. One of the marks of someone who's truly saved and born again is they have a love of the truth. Lord, show me the truth. There's things in this book I don't understand, Lord. Can you show me the truth? Okay. Not my truth. That's the biggest deception today. They, some people go into this trying to get this book to say what they want it to say. Even men that I highly respect have gone into this book and done teachings where they've twisted scripture to get it to say what they want them to say. Okay, we've got to be careful with that. You're supposed to go into it saying, God, show me what you want it to say. Okay. But they went to Jesus saying, we don't understand the parable. Could you explain it to us? People have a love of the truth. Nobody else went to him and asked him that was in that crowd, that huge crowd where he's saying, he that hath ears, let him hear. 
Only the apostles came to him. Verse 11, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. 1 John 3.18 says, Keep your hand there, because we're going to keep going through Mark 4. But 1 John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Back to what I was saying. One of the biggest examples of someone who's truly saved and more likely that they're saved is that they have a love of the truth. What's a guarantee someone's lost is if they hate the truth. They don't have a love of the truth. Okay, truth is relative, you know. It's my opinions and my feelings, and that's what the, drives them. They're, li they're lost. Someone who has a love of the truth that says, God, what's your truth? Show me your truth. There's things in here I don't understand, Lord. Can you help me? You study the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay, you, live, you do your best to live the Bible. Remember, it just said there, but in deed and in truth. You take this truth and you have good deeds. You're living it. That's why we say live the truth. Mm -hmm. So back to Mark 4.13. I just wanted to use that verse to ex explain that you had these apostles coming to him and saying, we don't get it, Lord, explain it to us. We want to know what it means. Explain it to us. No one else did. Mark 4.13, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? It's a question mark. Now get this. And how then will ye know all parables? Parable of the sower is the parable of parables. If you don't get this one, you're not going to get any of the parables I've been speaking. It's basically what Jesus is saying. Know ye not this parable? Then how, then how then will ye know all parables? Okay, it's all about Jesus Christ and his word. 14. The sower soweth the word. Now I put in here John 8. If you want to turn there, John 8 verse 47 states, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. And we preach that a lot, okay? This is the parable of parables. If you, can't, if you can't get this, you're not going to get any of them, okay? If you're not truly saved and born again and have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not going to get God's Word. He that's of God, Holy Spirit in you, truly saved, born again, heareth God's words. Ye hear them not, because ye are not of God. Because ye are not of God. Okay, I read it right. I just want to bring that up. Okay, this, these three-part studies is for saved sinners, not lost. If you're lost, you need to get saved. You need to get born again. You need to repent, believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, death, burial, and resurrection, that, that Jesus that died on the cross is God fully and completely. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. All right. But this is, the whole point I'm pointing out here is this is for saved people. The, this stu this three-part study is okay. salvation in this life for people that are already saved you're internally secure you're going to heaven when you die that salvation's there we've done the study on that getting saved salvation for lost sinners this is salvation for saved sinners for brothers and sisters in Christ mark chapter 4 verse 15 and these are they that are by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away, sorry, taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Turn the page. Now there's there's a very important part there I have underlined. It didn't say it was in their head. What did it say? It said it was sown in their hearts. These are people that, you're, that you preach the gospel to and you think you're reaching them. You're really getting close to reaching them. They, they, they could give their life to Christ at any time. And what Satan does is come around and offers them the world and takes the, snatches the word up. Mm -hmm. It's sown in their hearts, not their heads. It says in their hearts. And Satan comes and takes the word away. And when you take the word away, what does that do? They just go back to the world. Well, no, I, I was almost interested, but no, I choose the world. What happened? The word was taken out of their heart. Now, they can't, Satan can't do that without their permission. You know, there's no one person who can sit there and say, it's not my fault I didn't get saved. It's Satan's. They can't do that. But they choose the world 
over the Lord. Right. Keep your hand there. Turn to John chapter 8, verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Stop there saying. He comes and he takes the word, God's word, out of their hearts that was sown in their hearts and replaces it with his own and the world. So they're run by the flesh and they end up following Satan and doing Satan's will. What's Satan's will? He doesn't want anybody to get saved. Is it, do people get saved? Yeah. But he doesn't want people to get saved. You get a lot of false converts that help prevent other people from getting saved. You have a lot of lost people, like atheists, up that do their best to prevent people from getting saved. They're doing the bidding of their father, the devil. Right? Verse 45, And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. This is Jesus Christ. I underline that, because brothers and sisters of Christ, how many times have we tried to preach? Now, Jesus said that a prophet is without honor, I think the word's honor, except in his own country. Okay? But how many times have you tried to preach to people that know you, that you care about, you love them very much, but because it's you, they won't believe you. Oh, it's just my son. Oh, it's just my brother. Oh, it's just my nephew. Oh, it's just my husband. So on and so forth. Someone who knows you before you got saved, and then you get saved, and they won't trust you. Okay? Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. How can you hear God's words? Satan comes in and takes it out of your heart. You can't do that to someone who's saved. But that's what he does to the lost world to prevent people from getting saved. He comes through and goes, I'm going to take God's word out. As we're going to see, God's word is number one needs to be number one in your life. You need to start your day with the Word of God. You need to end your day with the Word of God. And just reading, it's not enough. 2 Timothy 2.15, you're supposed to study and rightly divide. That's not enough. You just read where you're supposed to, in word, not just in word, but in deed. You're supposed to love the Lord in deed and in truth. How you live your life for the Lord, obey, doing your best to obey His Word, your heartfelt desire to not want to sin, to want to live right, and to do right according to God's word, His way, not our way. Okay, that desire's there. But Satan comes through and he just takes it away from a lot of people that you look and you go, I'm almost, I'm, I think I'm reaching them. And then all of a sudden they do a 180, just go hardcore to the world, want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. What happened? That word got taken. They let that word that was sown in their hearts, they let Satan take it away. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, the body, you know, body, soul, and spirit, study for the Godhead, should shine unto them. Okay? What's going on? Satan takes the word that's sown in their hearts. Why? Because then he can blind them. He blinds their minds. What? So they won't get saved. They won't believe. It says there that he blinds the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He doesn't want them to believe. So how do you do that? You take this book away from them. You take the word that's sown in their hearts by brethren that are preaching the gospel and witnessing the plan of salvation. You take that away. Then you can blind them. Satan can blind them and prevent them from believing in Jesus Christ. Romans 2.5 says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, remember the, the word is sown in their hearts, then the word's taken away. What happens after a while? Okay. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Okay. The thing is about the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. 
are all having to answer for our deeds. The difference is, people in the judgment seat of Christ is for saved sinners who are eternally secure. Jesus paid the ultimate price, which is the punishment that we should go to hell. He paid the price. We don't have to go to hell. People at the judgment, uh, the great white throne, Jesus didn't pay for their sins. Once you get there, it's too late. Jesus is standing there. He's going to judge everybody that's there. Everybody that's there that deserves to go to hell is going to go to hell. And their deeds are going to be judged. Okay? And those people, I wouldn't be shocked when we stand there, brothers and sisters of Christ, with Jesus Christ. Um, he's going to be on the throne. We're going to be back there. That A lot of these people have hardened hearts. They're going to come up here and try to blame anything and everything. They will not take responsibility. They're probably going to have a lot of them that are just going to still be hateful and spiteful towards Jesus. We always think they're all going to just be on their knees crying. They're going to be on their knees and saying that Jesus is Lord, absolutely. But they have hardness of heart. Very hard. I mean, look at Revelation, the time of Jacob's trouble, when God's pouring out his wrath. They know it's God pouring out his wrath. And instead of repenting, they're getting mad at God and yelling at God and spitting at God. Hardness of heart. All right. That's another thing, too. Okay. God will get to a point where He's opened so many doors for you. And I look at my life. Why, I always ask myself, Brother and Sister Christ, why didn't I get saved when I was younger? God, Looking back, God opened up plenty of doors. And there's plenty of times I could have died and end up winding up in hell. But God didn't let me die. All right. God's patient. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but God's patient. But God will get to a point where He says, You know, you want the world? Have it. Your heart becomes hardened. You want the world? I've given you plenty of opportunities. You could have gotten saved so many times. But you keep choosing this world. Satan, you let Satan dominate and rule your life and take my word out of your heart that was sown in your heart. You want the world? You can have it. And God steps back. God's very patient. We're going to get into this. He's very patient. He doesn't do that after one time. You go back to Moses in the Old Testament with Pharaoh. He didn't harden Pharaoh's heart the first time. I think it was the second or third time, but I think it was the third time. Like he gave him three chances. Could be wrong. So I have to go back and refresh my memory on that. But he didn't harden Pharaoh's heart the first time. He gave him a chance. But he knew the future. He knew no matter how many chances he gave Pharaoh, it wasn't going to happen. But be careful, brother and sister Christ. You're going to have to deal with those types of people in this world. People that you almost win for Jesus Christ, and they do a complete 180, and their heart becomes so hardened that no matter what you say, they're not going to listen anymore. And you get so down, and you beat yourself up thinking you did something wrong, because you're like, they were almost there. They were almost there. You didn't do anything wrong. Satan came and took the word that you, the God's word that you sown in their hearts. They just took it away. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it so important for Satan to come and immediately take away the word? We've already explained a little bit of it, but let's go through some verses. Mm -hmm. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and, and... This is the part a lot of people leave out. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. If Satan can take that word that's sown in your heart out from these people, you're trying to put Jesus Christ in their heart and saying, hey, prick their heart, get them to come broken, repentance. All right. He can take that out. He can prevent people from believing. We're only capable of believing in Jesus Christ because we have a perfect written record. We have God's perfect written word. Today it comes in the form of the King James Bible for English-speaking people. But God's Word, okay, that's what it is. If, they, if Satan can take that away, he can prevent people from believing in Jesus Christ, if you let him. Okay. Uh, Psalms 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. When we're preaching to these people that are lost, we're convicting them of sin. It's God's Word that convicts people of sin. It still convicts even saved sinners today. It should be convicting you of sin that's still in your life or sin that you allow back in your life that you got out of your life in the past. 
okay? But if Satan can get God's word out of those people's hearts that you're sowing in there, the conviction of sin's not there. It's gone, okay? That's why we as Christians hide God's word in our heart. We don't want to sin against him anymore. When I was get, just before I got saved, I had that conviction, that heartfelt conviction that was put on me by God's word. I'm a sinner. Look at all the bad things that I've done. I've sinned against God, my creator. Now I'm on my way to hell and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against him. That conviction and having that sorrow for sinning against him is there. It's not there if the word of God isn't there. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Once again, it's God's word that helps us be sanctified, to set a good example for the world. For Jesus Christ, of being a light to the world for Jesus Christ. Okay. Psalms 119.9 reads, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Heed thereto. You take God's word, it starts out here, and then you put it here, and then you live it. You, that's what it means to take heed. If I give you instructions on how to get to a place, and somebody else gives you completely different instructions on how to get to the place, and you follow my instructions, that's the ones you did, and you got to the place, whose instructions did you heed? Mine. But how do you know you heeded my instructions? Because you physically followed them. It's not a hard concept to understand when people try to attack the whole concept when it says heed, it's action. When you heed someone's words, it's because you're taking them in and you're following them. Turn to Ephesians 5.19. Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God, giving thanks in all things unto God, and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Two points there. If Satan can take the word of God out of their heart, they're no longer giving God thanks for anything. Who are they giving thanks to? The world. Themselves. Mankind. Ultimately, Satan. Okay. And the fear of God, we've already talked about that, gets taken. Without the word of God sown in their hearts, the fear of God, just, you notice that. People, they start getting a little afraid, and you're like, I'm reaching them. They're getting convicted. I can see the conviction. I'm sowing God's, you're, when you're witness to them, you're sowing God's word in their heart. And then all of a sudden, 180. The fear's gone. The conviction's gone. They want the world. They don't care what you have to say. What happened? Satan came in and took the word that you sow, God's word that you sown in their heart. Just takes it away. The other thing, just a side note, verse 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another. Are you supposed to be a one-man show? Lately, I've been noticing a lot of people, a lot of brethren in ministry on um, YouTube. This is a whole side note, but we read the verse. I'm noticing that they're becoming a one-man show. Okay, They're not really accountable to anybody. And me, I'm going to be honest with you, I have nobody physically. I have an uncle that's, what is it, uh, two and a half hours away, you know, over 100 miles away that he could come over and catch me doing something I'm not supposed to and hold me accountable. The whole point I mean by that is not that I'm you know, he's going to catch me, but you know what I'm saying? Being that physical, being there physically. That's what Paul was talking about. Physically, he was there sometimes. Sometimes he heard letters with witnesses that were physically there that saw him doing stuff that they weren't supposed to do, trying to hold them accountable. But today we're so spread out. Where's the real accountability? A lot of people say, I'm accountable to the body of Christ, but are you really accountable to the body of Christ? Who's physically there holding you accountable to this book? It's hard in these last days. But be careful if you're a man in ministry to not fall into the one-man show. And having that attitude that if you don't like what I'm doing, go somewhere else. There's some justification to that statement, but sometimes that statement can be misused. Because of pride. Okay? Be careful. We're not supposed to be a one-man show. Fear tends to disappear when you are not physically accountable to the brethren. That's why Paul had to keep telling them, not just in my presence, but even in my absence. Because he realized when it, the fear is definitely there when he's there. 
but he's letting him know that the fear needs to still be there even if he's not there, if he's not present. That fear and trembling still needs to be there when you start doing wrong according to his word and start straying and start looking at the world and going the world's way, okay? Back to, if Satan can take the word away, okay, he can take the fear out of your hearts. And here's the thing. It says there, submitting yourselves one to another. I have God's word sown in my heart. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you should, if you're truly saved, have God's word sown in your heart. And if we are being, submitting ourselves one to another, we're submitting ourselves to the word of God. Okay? That fear is there. But if he takes that uh, submitting ourselves one to another away, he can take the fear away. He can get Christians, brethren, the fear to not quite be there. It should always be there, but you know what I'm saying? He can distract you, and there's no brethren to say, hey, focus. You're getting distracted by this over here. You're getting tempted by this over here. Stay focused. The fear slowly disappears. And then the pride comes in. All right. Got to be careful. Just wanted to throw that in there. Right. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. When you got God's word sown in your heart, we do, brothers and sisters Christ, we give God glory. And we're supposed to give God glory for everything. And if you can't give God glory for it, I've already talked about this numerous times, if you can't give God glory for it, you shouldn't be doing it. I build a garden and I'm growing healthy food. I'm getting it up and running now that we're starting to get good weather out here. Uh, I can give God glory for that. I can't give God glory for video games, movies, and TV shows, satanic style music, um, cigarettes, alcohol, being a drunkard, okay, so on fornicating, so on and so forth. I can't give God glory for that stuff. But there are people who sure to try, trying to deceive themselves why they don't have the, God's word in their heart. Where's the fear? I'd have fear trying to give God glory for some of that, any of that, any of that stuff. But you still have people out there profess to be saved that will give God glory for that stuff. And it's like, where's the fear? Where's the trembling? God's word has been taken out of their heart. You're dealing with false converts. Or you're dealing with a brother and sister in Christ that have stumbled and fallen. And they need to be reminded, submitting one to another, hey, you need to repent, you need to forsake, you need to get back to your walk with the Lord. Pick up that cross that you just dropped and get back to following Jesus Christ. They need that encouragement. Right? They need that accountability. But we're supposed to give God glory in all things. You can't do that if God's word isn't sown in your heart. Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk as you have us for an example. This is Paul. He's not saying me. You follow me, the one-man show. He says, us, for an example. There's other men with Paul. Okay. It's not just in word, it's in deed. Paul spoke and he lived. You have us for an example. Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. Why is he weeping? Because today you have a lot of professing Christian. Over half the world's population believes in A, Jesus Christ. I'll say it again. A, Jesus Christ. But they don't believe in the singular Jesus Christ. There's multiple antichrists out there. False Christs. Right. And he's weeping. That they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. They want to go to hell, and they're going to do everything they possibly can to get there. Have you ever met some of those people? It just feels like that. They could still get saved. I'm not saying it's impossible, but they just have that attitude that they want to go to hell. They don't say it like that, but they just have that attitude, their actions, and, and how they treat you when you try to preach truth to them. Remember what Jesus said? Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They just have that attitude. I want to go to hell, and they're going to do everything they can to make it possible. But, and then what is it? Rejecting Jesus Christ. Refusing to repent. You have professing Christians out there that re refuse to repent. Something as simple as repentance. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The real Jesus Christ of Scripture. Confessing both in prayer. Where's the harm in that? There isn't any. Asking God to save you. What a concept. 
I'm on a ledge about to fall over. I'm going to be screaming for help and asking for someone to save me. Why is that so hard for some people? They're so determined that they want their end to be destruction. They're so determined they want to go to hell. You've come across those people. I've come across those people whose God is their belly. They're flesh driven. They're not Holy Ghost driven. They don't have a love of the truth. They don't understand God's word. Look at the life they're living. They look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes, but they call themselves Christians. Their God is their belly. And you can see that. And whose glory is in their shame. They don't give God the glory. They don't have God's word sown in their heart. They have the world sown in their heart. Their flesh is in charge. Satan whispering lies and deceit to them. Oh, you can be a Christian and you can have the world too. Okay? They glory in their shame. Who mind earthly things. One of the biggest things to prevent people from getting saved and those that do, to prevent them from being fruitful. Okay? That's why Satan takes the uh, word that's sown in people's heart away. Why he tries to mess up Christians who do have the word of God sown in their heart. God can't, Satan can't take it away. But he can try to get you to turn your back on it. To ignore it. Okay? And that way you're not that fruitful. But brothers and sisters, mind earthly things. You lose sight of eternity. We're talking about salvation in this life. You know what salvation in this life with a good motivator? The fear and trembling. Why? Because you're thinking of the judgment seat of Christ. How often, brothers and sisters of Christ, do you think of the judgment seat of Christ? Is that something that hardly ever comes up in your mind? Are you stuck in the earthly things? You're starting to fall into that trap of the lost world, just minding what's he the here and now. You're not thinking of eternity. Okay? You're not thinking of, hey, someday I'm going to have to still answer to Jesus Christ. Something to think about. There's... I tend to think about it more than anything when I start to get tempted and I'm doing wrong and I'm not living right. That's when I think of the judgment seat of Christ the most, which is a good thing. That fear and that trembling needs to be there. Let's go back to Mark. So we talked about that. That's mainly for lost people, but to warn you, that's why it's so important that this book, that Satan's trying to do away with the Word of God. He doesn't want it sown in people's hearts. And if you're saved and born again, you've chosen Jesus over the world. And said, Lord, I don't care what it costs. I'm not talking about cost as far as getting saved. Being saved. It costs. We're going to talk about some things. It costs you things being saved. Okay. You realize you spend a lot of time in this book. When you were lost, you didn't spend a lot of time in this book. When you're saved, when you were lost, everybody loved you. Now that you're saved, you lose family, you lose friends, people close to you, very dear to you, you're going to lose. Okay? There's a cost to being saved, to being a Christian, Christian and living a life of Christ. There's a cost. There's not a cost to getting saved. It's a free gift. But the deception is, is... There's no cost, period. You can get saved and the world can still love you. You can still love the world and be just like the world. And that's why we got so many false converts out there. Let's get back to Mark chapter 4, verse 16. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. They're offended. I've always said that these are those people that they get to a point where it starts out where they're going through good times, newly saved, probably in the moment, hey, the hands raising, the satanic fleshly music, they're in the moment, hey, this is great. And then when bad times hit, they're like, wait a minute, wait, 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 this isn't what I signed up for. And it isn't. They never gave, truly gave their life to Christ. But God's word wasn't sown in their heart. They were going on a flesh high. You have some people that do it because I want to be part of this group because the group kind of seems great. And they get in the group and figure, like, if I'm using us, the truth, 
Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, oh, you got something I'd like. I see joy there. I see peace there. And they get in and they say, well, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll say that. I'll just say a little prayer. And yeah, I'll just believe faith alone. And wait a minute, I'm getting persecuted for this? Because this tells me I have to live a certain way and the world's going to try to push me to do it everything opposite and contrary to this book. I'm going to have family and friends turn against me. I might lose my job. I might lose my wife. I might lose my husband. I have my children turn against me. Hey, this isn't what I signed up for. And they go right back to the world. Okay. Notice it's Stony Ground who have heard the word, heard the word, it's up here, but they have no root. doesn't use the word sown in their hearts like the first one did. It just said they have no root in themselves. It's not down here. So you got to be careful with those types of people that you come across. They say, oh yeah, I've had so many people praise me for my magnets. And then when I sit there, like they're, just, they're Christians and it's great and everything. And we sit there and talk and after a while I realize... They're not saved. Why? They don't have God's word sown in their heart. They use Bible perversions. They go to these Babel buildings. Well, they're a Mormon. They're Jehovah's Witness. They're Catholic. They're not saved. There's only one way to heaven, and you're going to only find it in the King James Bible. It's been totally perverted and destroyed in all the other Bible perversions. There's only one plan of salvation that leads to heaven, that leads to God's grace. We're going to get to that verse here in a second. Okay. It's only found in the King James Bible. God's Word's not sown in your heart. Okay, It's not in these people's hearts. And they have the attitude of, that's not what I signed up for. And I also like to put up, bring up again, also people that get caught in the moment, these flesh services. They get really fleshly, you know, oh, is there things with the fleshly music and everything, the clapping and... I mean, even with the lost world, the dance clubs and everything, it's all about the flesh. Okay, and in these Babel buildings, these satanic buildings, you get them enticing the flesh and you get these people that, oh, this sounds great, it's a great party, it's a great show, you know? And then when everything dies down the next day, they're like, wait a second, this isn't what I signed up for. The good time's not here. Mm -hmm. the persecution arises, affliction and persecution. Now remember, it says affliction or persecution. Affliction, you mean I really got to do, obey God? I belong to Him? Oh, I didn't give my life to Him. I do what I want. Nobody tells me what to do. Matthew 10, 34. Think not I've come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Okay? And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for, for my sake shall find it. Okay? When you get saved, you're going to be public enemy number one. The number one people, number one group of people that all groups hate is Bible believing, truly Bible believing, God fearing men and women. You have some fakes out there that are purposely trying to get people to hate Bible believing, God fearing, but they don't need his help. I say his because uh, I remember, I um, can't think of the guy's name, but he's up there and he's promoting uh, racism and hates the Jews, and I can't think of the guy's name, but um, Steve Anderson. You know, and he's getting people, the, the world, to look at him and go, that's what a Bible-believing Christian is? He doesn't need to do that for the world to hate us. The world's just going to hate us. People who reject Jesus Christ and don't have His Word sown in their hearts and don't want their word, His Word sown in their hearts, they're going to hate us. Okay. And this is for the three things, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's three things we haven't got to them yet. The three main things we're going to be talking about that will mess up a Christian in your walk today. And this kind of goes with one of them. Okay, cares of this world. Children, wives, husbands, family, mothers and fathers. Okay, there's things in this world that's going to try to pare you down and pull you away from the Lord. Okay, 
Do you love the Lord more than you love your children? I know some people that say, yes, I do, but I've seen in some brethren's lives where they, they tend to put the children first above the Lord. They put their wives and their husbands first above the Lord. Okay? These people see that what God comes first, His Word comes first, there's a changed life, I'm going to suffer affliction from the world as a whole, because I'm no longer part of the world. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. They see that. And they're like, this isn't what I signed up for. And they just do a 180 and turn back to the world. Right? Remember that. See, people get in the way and your own flesh gets in the way. But mainly, your life is not your own. And these people that this is talking about in this parable, that have no root in them, God's Word's not sown here, it's up here. We know tons of people like that, professing Christians, where it's up here, but it's never down here. Remember that saying that you missed heaven by 13 inches. God's Word's up here, but it never gets sown down in your heart. Okay, you have no root. No, there doesn't have to be a change. Okay, my life is my own. I can decide what I want to do and what I would I hear that so many times. Well, my opinion, and I feel in a lot of the comment sections under a lot of the Brethren's videos. They don't use scripture, and the, sometimes they use scripture, they're right. Sometimes they use scripture, and they're twisting scripture. So you got to be careful. Your opinions and feelings, in the end, if they don't line up with the Word of God, they don't mean squat. Mm -hmm. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. You can be a Christian and be loved by the world still. No, you can't. If you were of the world... The world would love his own, but because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. We are in this world. We have to still live here. Salvation in this life. But we are not of the world. We're set apart. We're supposed to be different. And there's times where I failed the word, wor uh, failed the word, failed the Lord, and I've set a bad example as a Christian. And I know a lot of you brothers says Christ have too. I've set good examples, but I've set some bad examples as a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to look like the world or act like the world. Mm -hmm. What's going on with these people here that have no root? These people are still of the world and wants the world to love them. Cannot stand the persecution. They cannot stand the affliction of being different. Living a sanctified life. A clean life. A life after who? Christ. We're going to get some verses talking about being in Christ. They can't stand that. Mm -hmm. Mark 4.18. Go back to Mark 4. This is the main one parable for us that God put on my heart that we'll talk about in this three-part study. Mark 4.18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitful of riches, and the lust of other things enter in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. Now people say, well, it doesn't say the word sown, but here's the thing. We're going to get into some verses where it talks about trees that are sown that aren't fruitful. It's sown, the tree grows, but there's no fruit. It's unfruitful. There's very little fruit. There's good fruit, and there's bad fruit. Okay. So these are which are sown, because he uses the word sown, among thorns. Three things that will mess you, so we can get right, right into it now. I know it's took it a little bit, but these three things are going to really, really mess you up as a Christian, your walk with the Lord. These three things will really mess up a man in ministry. It'll make you less fruitful, or it'll mess up your ministry completely, destroy your ministry. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things flesh sends the flesh okay. it says it enters in chokes the word and it become unfruitful chokes the word if you cannot breathe what happens people say well you die well yeah you die but you're not living spiritually speaking you're not living and who are you supposed to be living for Jesus Christ if you let these things come in and start choking the word the word starts going back here and cares of this world are more of your distraction. So the word, you're not listening to the word anymore. Can't even hear it. You're distracted by the cares of this world. 
You're distracted by the deceitfulness of riches. You get distracted by the lusts of other things. And it'll come in and it will hurt your walk with the Lord. The fruit that you bear. Salvation in this life. Okay. Put on here judgment. I always say judgment begins here and then goes out there. There's times where I fall into the trap of being distracted by cares of this world. The Lord's really blessed me. I'm not really deceitful of riches. There's times where I do. I'm like, I'd love to have a good boat to go out and go fishing. At my age, my back, doing that uh, kayak fishing, it's, it's tough work. I've been blessed. The Lord has not knocked me off my kayak. Uh, well, I've fallen off the kayak trying to get into the ocean, trying to get past the waves at first. But that's easy to get back up. Okay, let's try it again, you know. But I'm talking about out on the water, the thought of falling off and having to figure out how to get back. It's hard to get back on those kayaks at my age. Um, I'd love to have a boat. Those boats are too expensive. Not worth it. Okay, I'm not going to fall into that deceitfulness of riches. Now, there's a lot of things I like to fix up around here. Uh, I'm not going to fall into the deceitfulness of riches. I really haven't had struggled with that, but people struggle somewhere. I struggle with the cares of this world, and I struggle a lot with the lusts of many things, of other things. Okay, temptation of sin when it comes. I've told this in my, um, when I gave my testimony, when I was lost, the things that really pricked my heart was the porn. I was a porn addict, video game addict, movie addict, TV show addict, some secular music. But those were the big things that really was destroying me before I even got saved, they were destroying me because the wages of sin is death. Okay, after I got saved, those were the hardest things that God really had to work hard and I struggled with God and sometimes I struggled against God getting those things out of my life. Okay? Judgment begins here. Okay? Those three things can really, really destroy your walk, brothers and sisters in Christ with the Lord. It can get you to fall and sometimes fall apart. But here's the good news. Jesus can still pick you back up and put you back together, even as a Christian. That's why you have that verse that says, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily. God knows you're going to drop it daily. Pick it up daily and follow Jesus Christ and follow me, what the verse says. He's talking, it's Jesus Christ talking. You need to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. And this is before he died. It's to us, okay? Every day we're going to have to pick up our cross. God knows this. The struggle is going to be there, but the three things that will really cause you to drop, it can all be summed up that help that you drop your cross a lot, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things. Matthew 3.10 says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John the Baptist. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Two different baptisms. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat in the garner. That's baptism with the Holy Ghost. Wheat in the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's the second baptism with fire. Heaven, hell. Eternity with Jesus Christ. Eternity with Satan. What's it going to be? Right. But we see what's God's attitude to a tr towards a tree that bears no fruit. A Christian that's truly saved and born, born again, I cannot believe until someone proves otherwise, they'll have zero good fruit. There'll be some. Even if it's small and a little bit, there'll be some to someone who's truly saved. That's evidence, we're going to get to that, of salvation. But what's God's attitude to a tree that has no fruit? fruit when it comes to the lost world. Now I didn't write this down, but some good fruit can be reprobate. What does that mean? If you're doing good things and you're lost, you've rejected Jesus Christ. You do some good things that are good works, but they're reprobate. They're worthless. One sin destroys all of it as far as eternity is concerned. Without Jesus Christ, one sin will send you to hell. And makes you worthy of hell and you deserve to go to hell. One sin. You can do a million good works. One sin, you're going to hell. Now I said you're going. Not that you're there. You're going. But you can still get saved. 
God can save you from hell. Turn to Luke 13, 6. Here's another parable about a tree. He spake also this parable. This one is more, I apply, I apply this one more to save sinners. Or people that like in my life where God waited and was very patient and long-suffering until I got saved. All right? He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I came seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why come it at the ground? Now understand, he's talking about he planted it, three years, no, tr no fruit, cut it. But I look at this for Christians, for this study, there's times where you're going to go through periods in your life where you're going to see, feel like you have no fruit. And it's because you don't. What's going on? You let cares of this world get in, you let uh, deceitfulness of riches come in, and you let the lust of other things come in and choke the word. So you stop reading the Bible, you don't pray as much, and you start falling into the world. You'll never look like the world, no matter how hard you try, but your life is, and your walk with the Lord is just falling apart. And you're going to have to answer for that at the judgment seat of Christ. Work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. But we see here, the tree's got no fruit. Verse 8. And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I have shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. If not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. G give me one more year. Try to get it to bear fruit. I'll dung it. Anybody who's like, I've got a two fruit trees I planted, and I've got a garden going, and I do mess with uh, horse manure when it comes to my garden and everything. And it does help things to grow hardy and healthy. And it does help with more being more fruitful. It does. Okay? But God's long-suffering. He's patient. Okay? But what's his attitude towards somebody who's not bearing good fruit? For a saved sinner, he's going to bring, that's where the chastening comes in. To the lost world, be careful. You might end up dying and going to hell. And you lose any and all opportunity to get saved. God has such mercy, preaching the gospel more than once to people. I'll put that down in my notes. There's times where, I, I know I say it sometimes, I know some of the other brethren are hardcore about saying, preach the gospel and then let them alone. There's still times where I have grace and love for people that I've preached the plan of salvation more than once to the same person. Okay? Because I'm desperate to see people get saved in these last days. Especially people I love and care about. People that are closer to me than just some stranger on the street. Okay? I do do that. Okay? God, in my life, like I said, there's so many times I could have gotten truly born again and wasn't a fake convert, false convert, fake. Um, but I was so wound up in the world. Satan came and took that the, uh, seed, uh, seed that was sown in my heart, God's Word. Took it out, and I continued with the world. I was, bl I was blessed that it never got to the point where my heart got hardened. Okay. Praise the Lord. I give God glory in all things. But what's God's attitude to a Christian, a tree, that's not fruitful? Okay. Let me dung it and give it another chance. God's, that's where the chastening comes in. 2 Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a lot to that when it comes to salvation and in the life of a Christian. God wants you to repent. Repentance starts at salvation and it goes all the way through the life of a Christian. And there's times where we can be stubborn, bullheaded, prideful, so into the flesh that we refuse to repent. And God will chastise us. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son, what son is he whom the Lord chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. One of the evidence, these are all evidence of someone who's saved. First of all, there's a changed life, but they have a love of the truth. 
Okay. Fear. They fear the Lord. Their attitude towards sin changes and they fear the Lord. Another thing is, is the chastening. When they do fail the Lord, is there chastening in their life? There's been chastening in my life. Sometimes I always tell people, if you can get that repented fast and ASAP, there's sometimes where it doesn't feel like there's any chastening because for that thing you did because you repented, forsaked, got it out of your life, God knows your heart, you're back to doing what's right, and there might be no consequences, present tense. You're still going to have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ, but present tense. But there's times where God has actually chastened me because I really got stuck on things I shouldn't have been. Started straying. Getting distracted by the cares of this world. Getting distracted by the lust of other things. Some of you can get distracted by the deceitfulness of riches. Not trying to be like super rich, but the Bible says we're supposed to be content with food and raiment. Therewith be content, and you forget to do that. It can be something as simple as just wanting a boat, <laughs> like I mentioned. Something as simple as, you know, wanting a, a bigger house. Next thing you know, you got multiple properties, multiple vehicles, multiple jobs, because you want to live this lifestyle. With the, you're working so hard to live off-grid, it becomes a care of this world, and it gets in the way of your ministry. It gets in the way of your walk with the world. You want to live in the city. It's expensive in some cities, especially here. It's a small city. It's expensive. To live here most of the time there's no place no places to rent even okay just holiday rentals but not like an apartment place to rent month to month and it's expensive well, I want to live in, exp uh, in a nice place like this that means I have to have two jobs and everything and it's like these cares of this world can get in the way okay? and when God sees that you're starting to stray and you're losing sight of him he'll chasing you and get you back on the right path it's a good thing you fear the chastening, but you thank God afterwards. I always said this. You fear the chastening, but afterwards you are cheering and thanking God and giving Him glory and thanking Him with all your heart for that chastening that got you back on the right path, that got you back to doing what was right. Okay. The wages of sin is death. Okay. I always want to put that out. Even if you're saved, if you get so messed up that you just get so far gone that you're just not listening to the Lord, Cut the tree down. Bring them home early. Okay? God will do that to some people. Okay? They start out great. They're serving the Lord. They love the Lord. They're saved. They're born again. And then cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things come in, and they can destroy a Christian. And they get so destroyed that God goes, bring them home early. We're going to bring you home early. You're going to miss out on some rewards if not a lot of rewards. Fear and the trembling needs to be there. Matthew 7.15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. I wanted to use scripture to prove what I was saying. Christians will have good fruit. Someone who's truly born again and saved will have good fruit. But you are to judge people whether they're saved or not by their works, by their fruits. Okay? Do they have a love of the truth? Do they fear the Lord, their attitude towards sin? Okay. The Word of God, their attitude towards the Word of God, you know. Uh, these right here says, beware of false prophets, okay. False prophets today tell people that you can be justified with the cares of this world, with the uh, deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. You can be justified and be saved. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. That's evil fruit. All these false teachers on there that preach a false plan of salvation, they take repentance out, they take asking God to save you out. It's just head belief. Not being sown down here in the heart. It's just head belief. Without repentance, it'll never, ever make it to your heart if you refuse to repent. It's only going to be up here. Every time. Okay? What's going on there? They're trying to teach that you can have all this stuff. Okay? You should know them by their fruits. 
If you have the Word of God sown in your heart, you can spot them out. This goes here, and you're just listening to what other men say, what the world says, false teachers say. You're not doing your own 2 Timothy 2.15 studying and doing your best to live according to this Word, rightly dividing, and you're just being a follower of men and not a follower of Jesus Christ. You can be deceived. All right. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If any man be in Christ, it's an if. It's a Bible condition. If you're a new creature. People say, new creature? That's just going from unbelief to belief. That's not a new creature. The new creature is someone who loves the truth in word and in deed. Both. The life they live. My life belongs to Jesus Christ now. Right? That's the changed life. And people attack that left and right. When you have a changed life, those three things you're going to be struggling with your whole life as a Christian. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lusts of other things. Galatians 6.5 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. They were trying to push works to be saved. No, no, no. You don't do good works to get saved. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. They are pushing that you had to do good works to get saved. Before you get saved, circumcision. Before you get saved, you have to be water baptized. Not Holy Ghost baptized, water baptized. Before you get saved, on and on and on. Paul say, no, no. After you're saved, that stuff happens as far as good works. You become a new creature after you get saved. It's guaranteed. That stuff doesn't save you. God does. And when God saves you, you become a what? A new creature in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 2.15 oh, right, I, did, I did put them down both <laughs> twice. Okay. God starts to clean up your life at salvation and is a lifelong process. There's going to be some major changes at first, okay? but your attitude towards what God calls sin and your love of truth, God's perfect written word, is what is the biggest changes. Your attitude towards sin and your love of the truth. Love of this book, King James Bible, the verses I'm reading that come from this book. Okay? That all changes instantly when you get saved. Okay. There's times I was, when I was newly saved, God was saying, you know what, that over there, he showed me the scriptures. That over there, you need to get rid of that. Oh, really, Lord? I love that. And then I start studying the word and I get convicted. The fear and trembling's there. The conviction's there. My love of the truth is there. My attitude towards sin is hating sin, which is what God wants. And I get rid of it. But I've been there for the, all the newly saved out there where you're, it just seems overwhelming sometimes because like, oh, come on, really? I got to get rid of that? Yep, got to get it out of there. What about that? Yep. It's a lifelong process. My life didn't change overnight. In fact, the first year, six months to a year being saved, you saw some differences in me, absolutely. But I was still struggling with a lot of things that I held on to and wasn't letting go at, of right away like I should have. I wish I did. Okay, video games being one of them. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in his mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Remember, dead in sins. Uh, Romans 8 talks about the law of sin and death. Uh, I did this whole teaching because I had to because somebody out there, I forgot his name, but people are starting to teach that you're not under any law, period, when you get saved. But that's not what the Bible teaches. We're no longer under the law of sin and death when you get saved. We're now under the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's also called the law of God. Paul talks about how with my mind I may serve the law of God, but with this flesh the law of sin. Notice he didn't say sin and death. This is in Romans. He didn't say sin and death. Death gets dropped. We're not going to go to hell when you get saved. But you're still under the law of sin. I'm still in this wicked, sinful flesh. I still struggle with sin to this day. We all do, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, remember that. 
when we were dead in sins, it's talking about the law of sin and death, not the law of sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. Verse 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Your soul is in my, my soul is in my body, and it's in heaven. Jesus is with me all the time. All the time. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Now, I had to make a big point. Jesus Christ, not an antichrist, not a false Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so many choose these antichrist Jesus that tells them what they want to hear. You can have cares of this world, don't worry about it. They're fine. You can have cares of this world. You can have deceitfulness of riches. You can have lust of other things. You can be like the world, look like the world, act like the world, and it's, it's not a big deal. They love those Jesus. The flesh love of the lost world loves that Jesus. Tells them what they want to hear and gives them what they want. But we're talking about the real Jesus Christ. Hates sin. Who cuts down, wants to cut down that tree that bears no fruit. Zero fruit. His attitude towards the lost. He has a door there. He wants you to be saved. But you reject Jesus Christ. And you die in your sins. Okay. This is the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. Has zero tolerance for sin. Hates sin. Hates evil. Okay. He tells you what to do through his word. And you do it. I'm pointing at the Bible. Okay. And you do it. That in the ages to come, he might show his exceeding riches of grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. A lot of these easy believes them people can't get that part. We call, I remember we used to call them out on it big time because they kept saying, I'm saved by my faith. I'm faith alone, faith alone. I'm saved by my faith. And we called them out and said, so you're saved by something you're doing. God didn't save you. You saved yourself. Oh, oh, well now we've got to change our wording around. See, we caught them. They're wrong. They're lost. They didn't, they don't, they're not saved by God's grace. Now some of them are starting to say grace alone. Well, that's what we've been teaching. It's God's grace that saves you. You can't save yourself. My faith didn't save me. God did. How did I find God's grace? Through faith. Through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I remember that song, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling, rock of ages. Okay? I don't preach that you do anything to earn salvation. It is a gift. After you're saved, you belong to Jesus Christ. You want to belong to Jesus Christ. God, come in, change my life, clean up my life, tell me what to do, and I will do it. That's the attitude of someone who's truly saved and born again. These people saying, no, there's no changed life. There doesn't have to be a changed life. They're lost. They get so angry and hateful with us. You know those people that say, that do a 180, say, this isn't what I signed up for? Well, those same people will look at you and see a changed life and realize, I don't have that. And they will hate you for it. You can see it online with the comments I get from some of the people in the past. Those people don't have the changed life. And they hate you for it because you have the changed life. Mm -hmm. We don't teach that it's works that save you. Um, I did a study once. That I did the what's called the road map analogy when it comes to finding God's grace. There's instructions that this God gives on how to find His grace. Paul says, and I don't have this written down, but Paul says that the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In other words, you've got to find it. But God gives you directions on how to find His grace. You go forward, hang a left, repent. Go forward a little bit, hang a right. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You go forward a little bit, hang a left. Confess both in prayer. Go forward a little bit, hang a right. Ask God to save you. Boom, you run right into God's grace. Any other way, you'll never find God's grace. You have to go through faith. It takes faith to repent. It takes faith to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Here. It takes faith to confess both in prayer. Okay? It takes faith to call out to a God that you can't see and you rejected your whole life to call out to Him and say, Lord, please save me. It takes faith. 
but it takes through faith. We're saved by God's grace, not by our faith. Our faith is how we find that grace. God put it there for us to find. We just have to follow His instructions. And we go out and preach that to the world. And like I said, with Satan, we, we sow this in people's hearts and they're like, you get people that seem like they're just on the verge of giving their life to Christ and then all of a sudden you don't know what happened. 180. They're just back into the world. They don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. Okay? We try to give them the instructions through faith how to find God's grace. How to be in Christ Jesus. They don't want it. Now, we keep going though. This is where they like to stop, the faith alone crowd, but those of us who believe in the grace, truly believe that we're saved by God's grace. It's not grace alone, it's grace, God's grace alone that saves us. But you have to go through faith. There's instructions on how to find that grace. Okay. But they like to stop there. They don't like to keep going. What does verse 10 say? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. What does it mean by be created in Christ Jesus? He created me twice. You know that? When I was born, he created me. First born from my mother, he created me. Then when I was born again, he created me again. When this says created in Christ Jesus, it's not talking about the first birth. It's talking about the new creature in Christ Jesus. Being born again as a Christian. A Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. Fear and trembling. Lovers of the truth. Right. Lover of God's word. It says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto means that good works is going to follow being created in Christ Jesus. It's guaranteed. Then it says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. No, it says, hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Someone said it says we should. But remember we read up there when it said every knee should bow? Every knee is going to bow to Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean, just because it says should, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay? There's going to be a changed life. You're going to have good works if you're truly saved and born again. And you brothers and sisters in Christ out there understand this. That struggle that you have with the flesh. I didn't struggle with the flesh. The flesh was in charge when I was lost. I realized that struggle, when I got saved and God started getting more and more things out, the more God cleaned up my life, the more my flesh threw the biggest fit in the world. Start out with some little small fits. Get this little thing out. Get that little thing out. Get the video games out. Oh, my flesh just goes crazy. Get the movies and TV shows out. No more of the porn. No more of this. No more of that. For you guys, no more alcohol if you had a problem with alcohol. Cigarettes, weed, feminism. Whatever. Your flesh just goes crazy. Ah! And starts throwing the biggest fit in the world. And we struggle with our flesh hardcore. What's wrong with these people that reject this? They don't have to change life. They see it in you, brothers and sisters in Christ. They see it in you guys. And they hate you for it. You can see the anger and the bitterness that they have in their heart. Not God's words not sown in their heart. It's anger and bitterness and hate. All right? You have to drop your pride and go about to establish your own righteousness to follow the instructions on and stop going about to establish your own righteousness to follow the instructions on how to find God's grace. What blocks people from finding God's grace is their pride and they go about to establish their own righteousness. I hate the term self-righteousness. Why is that, brother and sister Christ? It's not biblical. There's no such thing as self-righteousness. It's a figment of people's imagination. There's no such thing. The Bible says that they go about to establish their own righteousness. They're trying to. They're trying to have their own righteousness. But they will fail every time. Because the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Nobody's righteous yet. You have people that go about to establish their own righteousness. The only people that are going to find God's grace are the ones that drop their pride and stop going about to seek to establish their own righteousness and they look to Jesus Christ. And we have a lot of so-called professing Christians that are very prideful and they go about establishing their own righteousness. Even if it goes down to something like 
I'm saved by my faith. I save myself by my faith. And because I save myself by my faith, I don't have to have a changed life. I've earned it. I've earned salvation. I can live however I want to live and do whatever I want to do. And these people, it's just flat out what they are. They don't come out and verbally say that, but the life they live, that's what they stand for. They've earned salvation. What's going on there? Pride, and they're going about to establish their own righteousness. You'll never, ever find God's grace. We have. Now that we've found God's grace, brothers and sisters of Christ, what are the three things that will really mess up a Christian and hurt you? Okay. These are the three things. We'll go over them one more time. Um, cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. Okay. The lust of other things. I want to reiterate, what do they do? They come in and choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. This becomes unfruitful in your life. This, which once took a prominent place in your life, foundation, it starts to go away. How many of you guys can testify? Well, when I started falling into temptation, started choosing to sin, I fell back into some old addictions, and I didn't read the Bible as much as I used to. I wasn't praying as much as I used to. I used to pray all day, every day. I used to read the Bible in the mornings, but when I woke up in the evenings when I went to bed. I do Bible studies every day. I'd sing hymns as if I'm working around the house. I haven't done that in a week. I haven't done that in two weeks. A month. Three years. I'm going off that parable about the tree. Three years, no fruit. Those three things can really mess you up. So we're going to go through a three-part series and we're going to focus hardcore on the cares of this world. We're going to focus hardcore on the deceitfulness of riches. And we're going to focus hardcore on the lust of other things. We're going to finish Mark, uh, Mark 4.20. Turn back to Mark 4.20. What happens when you don't let these things get in the way? When the word is not being choked okay, by those three things. You're not letting Satan... Satan can't snatch the word away, but he can try to use the world, cares of this world, he can try to use the world and the flesh against you to get you to turn your back on this as a Christian, to mess you up as a Christian. What happens when you don't let those things get in? You stay focused. The word sown in your heart, it's speaking loud and clear. Mark 4.20, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Notice it says, some, uh, bring forth some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. How come it's not just hundredfold? All trees bring forth a hundredfold. We all have different struggles, brother and sister in Christ. You're going to have some people that's thirtyfold. And they're going to get up there and go, Man, I wish I had done more of the Lord. You're going to have some people that did better than me. I'm using me as an example that did way better than me and have a hundredfold when they stand before Jesus Christ. They're going to have a lot of good fruits. God understands that we're going to drop our cross. There's periods in our life as a Christian that we, it's not God's fault, we can't blame the world, we can't blame anybody else, this person right here's fault for me personally, the areas in my life where there's no fruit, it's my fault. But there's going to be areas in my life where there's no fruit. What can you do to fight this? Well, first you need to recognize what's causing you not to have any fruit. And then when you realize what's causing you not to have any fruit, and you get that out of your life, this will still stay prominent. It won't get choked. Okay. So hopefully we'll get into these studies and... I'll help, uh, especially in these last days, it'll help me, it'll help you, brethren. Judgment first begins here, then goes to the brethren, and I hope it helps you guys. So I just want you to know that grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? I'm in Christ Jesus, you're in Christ Jesus. That's where my love comes from. Okay? If it might have sounded harsh on some of the things I've said, brothers and sisters in Christ, know that I say it out of love. Okay? I want to help you, just as I want help from you, brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be holding each other accountable. We're supposed to be confessing our faults one to another. I don't see that happening hardly ever. People aren't saying where they're struggling. People are just keeping quiet and keeping it to themselves. Right. So I will see you in the next series of this study. Uh, part one of the study is going to be cares of this world.
So I'll see you later.